so I'm going to say brief, three brief things uh, by way of introduction, and then I have a talk I will read to you. Uh, first of all, with regard to the form of the talk, uh, so I'm going to say brief, three brief things. Uh, by... Sorry about that. It's okay. Is there really that much of a delay? Oh, well, now you're muted, but it's fine. Uh, I'll I'll just keep going and delay or yes, no yes, delay. Sorry, There's a little delay with the streaming. Sorry about that. It's fine. Good to keep in mind. Yeah, so three three remarks. I think I had three. We'll see. Uh, the the first is that the, the form this is written in uh, is related to uh, a form I discussed in a talk I gave at a past residency, and I can, now I can't remember exactly which one it was, but it was a talk about sentences, and um, it's in it's in our YouTube archive, so uh, it may be interesting if you're interested in the formal element to look at that. And I was trying to dig up the link, but I couldn't uh, before this talk. But I can track it down. I would be happy to share it. Uh, second. Um, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say here in the talk is based on uh, rereading this book here from cliche to archetype, just written by the media theorist and literary critic Marshall McLuhan with the poet uh, Wilfred Watson. They're both Canadians. So uh, a lot of the special terms uh, that you'll hear, they're defined inside the talk. But I would just like to make clear that I am borrowing and rewriting uh, uh, with in, in a kind of dance with somebody else's ideas. And uh, the third point uh, by way of introduction, which just relates to maybe the first thing I said, is that I considered whether or not I wanted to use examples in this talk. And I struggled with that question a little bit. I ended up deciding not to use examples, uh, partly for formal reasons and partly because uh, that is a, a kind of invitation to whatever conversation we might have. So with those three points out of the way, I'm going to read you a couple pages. And uh, feel free to, um, as, as, as I speak, uh, you, you can register questions in the chat or just note them down for yourself. But I'm not going to mind any of that until I'm I'm done. Recently, I heard someone read a poem accidentally full of cliches. The reader was telling his story, and it was not a pretty story. His voice was full of emotion. But I could barely hear the poem. Really, there was no poem. There was a dramatic reading of cliches. There was no poem. There was, however, a kind of document, something like surveillance footage or a recording made by a hidden listening device, an ambient record of a speech environment patterned into what was called a poem. One could take the previous designation of document, a failed poem, accidentally full of cliches, and turn it inside out. Inside out, it would be a poem with no remarkable phrases. I'll talk about phrases since what I have to say concerns poems and prose, fiction, and nonfiction. In fact, phrases are more fundamental than, than the distinction between poems and prose, though they appear in both. And the distinction between fiction and nonfiction is itself a fiction, dreamt up by publishers and other organizers of books. But phrases existed before books, and phrases will likely outlive the book. So think of phrases, think of a phrase. 
more than a single word, less than a sentence, enough for a line in a poem, but also perhaps part of a line, something hidden in a line in a poem. The phrase, if it's good, if it matters, is a probe. The phrase probes the environment. Your phrase probes your environment. By environment, I don't mean natural phenomena, or I do, but I mean those phenomena as filtered through media and technologies that we are, most of the time, barely aware of. Language being a medium and a technology. It's not the propaganda you can recognize as such that is doing its work on you. It's the propaganda that you don't recognize at all, the background hum you habitually tune out. Of course, propaganda is made of phrases and images, and if we stick with phrases, as I intend to do today, we may speak of an environment of phrases. That would be everyday speech, for starters. Have you ever noticed a new phrase enter into your environment with no explanation? The phrase appears on television, radio, and especially on social media. One by one, the people around you begin using the phrase. But most of the time, you don't notice these updates. They could be the anonymous churning of language, or they could be directed propaganda operations. It's not that the environment is propaganda. It's that successful propaganda must be environmental. Let's return to the phrase. I said, the phrase, if it's good, if it matters, is a probe. The phrase probes the environment. Your phrase probes your environment. And now I've said something about the environment. So let's talk about the probe. A probe is a calculated risk. Probing is experimental. It works like asking a question. And indeed, good questions are excellent probes. But a phrase can probe an environment merely by its presence. Most probes fail as most environments, sorry, most probes fail as most experiments reveal nothing remarkable. As most experiences reveal nothing remarkable. At the same time, Probing an experience that reveals nothing remarkable may itself reveal something remarkable. Because the phrase probes the environment, which most of the time reveals nothing remarkable. But if it shows something remarkable about the environment, the probe is successful and the phrase is good. Put the successful praise, phrase, praise, <laughs> praise the phrase, Put the successful phrase into a poem or a story, or a novel, or an essay, or a dialogue, or a confession. The poem, or story, or novel, or essay, or dialogue, or confession is now an anti-environment. The entire piece is remarkable as a container defined by certain constraints that serve as boundaries between environment and anti-environment. Something like that has always been art's work, though here I am speaking specifically about writing, or really writing to read something about writing. Inside the piece, the phrase is allowed to function as a probe. As a reader enters into the piece, he penetrates the barrier between environment and anti-environment. When he encounters the phrase, even if it is the first line of the poem, even if it is the title of the novel, he is already in the anti-environment, even if he does not realize it. Of course, some readers will not notice the phrase. They will read it, but fail to see its probing operation. For them, the piece is part of the environment. But those who make probe phrases don't write for such readers. Another name for the probe phrase is cliché. This is perhaps counterintuitive, but it can be true in two ways. 
First, because one way to make a probe phrase is to redeploy an environmental cliche within an anti-environment. In this way, a stock phrase that everyone has heard and usually ignores is recharged with significance. A calculated risk pays off. This may be in the form of humor or something that is not comic, something with a tragic form, for example. The second reason that a probe phrase is a cliche is that it will be one. Supposing it's a new phrase, not a redeployed cliche. If it succeeds and is repeated and remembered, it will be a cliche. And that is not a problem with the phrase or the piece that houses it. It's the inev inexorable pull of the environment on the anti-environment. Though the anti-environment lives on for some time, maybe for a very long time, a, su a, su <laughs> a successful probe phrase will eventually be quoted out of context. Out of context means that it circulates in the environment and that the environment over the years, over the decades and centuries, will do its work. Cliché is etymologically related to click. It comes from French. It's a technical word in printer's jargon for stereotype block. And much like stereotype, the negative valence comes from the association with endless and mindless reproduction. In principle, nothing is wrong with this reproduction. It's the work of the environment to repeat itself. Of course, there are many things wrong with certain environmental phenomena, such as the propaganda I discussed earlier. But setting propaganda aside, the environment is made of subtle repetitions. And the anti-environment must in many ways repeat as well, but in a way that makes a difference. In this way, the anti-environment is more informative than the environment. And great literature is, as Pound says, news that stays news. News that stays news can also be called archetype. Archetype is defined not as some mental or celestial phenomenon, but as that which most often recurs. Recurs as theme, value, or image. Think of it as that thing that you think is in a book you haven't read, but you want to read. What you suppose is there, and supposing you aren't disappointed, what you find there. You may be disappointed because it wasn't there or because it was there, but in a cliched form. In my language, this means there was no probe phrase. The old cliche retrieved by the probe phrase succeeds because it has archetypal resonance. In its retrieval operation, the probe phrase locates and redeploys the archetype through the cliche. Or in the future, even as it becomes cliche, the probe phrase is available for retrieval as archetype. Why all of this time talk? because the environment is largely spatial. It is actual space and it is an image of space. But the writer is a creator of phrases that probe into the environment. And to see if the probe phrase has made a difference, one must go farther than the immediate present. The whole history of language and literature must be open to the probe. Retrieval of the archetype is education, which is always counter propaganda and this is why I spoke of propaganda. Before writing, the cliche had its place as verbal formula in an oral environment. Formulas are easier to remember and provide relative stability in the environmental world of a language that's only recorded in memory. Once there is an environment combining speech and manuscript writing, the cliche persists due to the inherited importance of certain verbal formulas and the attractiveness they had as part of that importance. Lovely phrases to say important things. Manuscripts were written to be read aloud and as aids to memory. A poem was written to be sung. Once there is printing, the cliche process accelerates and indeed the cliche receives its name. Things get out of hand in the print environment faster and faster from books 
to pamphlets, to telegraphs and newspapers, to instant telecommunication. None of this shatters the archetypes, but it modifies their capacity to make sense when they do. Accordingly, there is more and more interest in form. What forms can anti-environments take so as to protect the probe phrase? This question has been answered in two ways I disagree with. One emphasizes something called originality, which is a way of describing an anti-environment from the outside by comparison with the environment. This pierces the piece's fragile membrane and nullifies the phrase's probing powers. The other answer I disagree with is to make the piece rhyme with the environment by making the phrase into a slogan, a propagandistic slogan. This may have short-term success. Slogans can very briefly be probes, but their work as probes is inevitably short-lived and subordinated to propagandistic goals. Propagandistic goals are pragmatic and immediate of the present, thus diffused in the environment. My answer is to make the anti-environment, the piece, indeed the artwork, pivot on the probe phrase. Everything begins with the phrase, even if the phrase is not at the beginning. Protect the probe phrase and its fragile work at all costs. Disguise the phrase. Camouflage the phrase. Dissimulate your intentions. Then the phrase will be able to do its work of retrieval of the past archetype or persistent projection into a future one. There is only one goal, only one criterion. The criterion is not novelty. The criterion is beauty. That's uh, what I wrote to read to you. So um, I am hoping Thank you. I am hoping, uh, like I said, I uh, I asked myself whether to use examples or not, and and I decided that I would rather not use examples and 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 deliver uh, any kind of conversation which invoked examples over to the discussion. So, I would love to hear uh, your thoughts, questions, of course, as well. So I have us unmuted in the room, just to let you know, and um, especially Michaela, Gina down here, if you guys all talk, try to project. Um, I'll start us off, Alejandro. Um, first of all, that was beautiful. Thank you for the, retrie the retrieval you just did. Um, it, I mean, just off the bat, like your thinking reminds me of the importance of slowing my reading down and and working phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, word by word. Um, you know, really sort of um, the way that writers, I think, really um, want and need to do, which is to sort of read every word. Um, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering about your own kind of close reading practice, if that makes sense, or or like your, um, or what, even what that brings up for you, um, just slowing down the process of reading or reading more closely. Um, okay, I'll give you two examples. One is that um, this doesn't apply to every poem, but uh, with many poems that I appreciate uh, and that I've read many times, if I look at them long enough, I start to see littler poems inside the bigger poem, right? So let's imagine a poem that's 10 lines long. And at a certain point, I say, well, something that's happening between the end of the third line and the beginning of the fifth is like almost like a separate poem that is like housed or concealed inside the poem. And that is a different poem. And so I start thinking of the, what I originally thought of as the poem as a kind of container that is 
nourishing and protecting the littler one. Um, I, I think, you know, some poets do this on purpose and others do it uh, maybe without meaning to, but, but uh, that's, that's a way of reading where you're, you're, you, you have, you can be flexible about, you know, what is the, what is the sense-making unit, right? Um, another example is, uh, is actually something I've, I mean, probably, you know, my, my, the the experience of close reading that's most present to me is translating and um you do get down to this word by word thing there sometime and uh, a lot of times i have the impression you know I've, I've translated a bunch of novels these past couple of years and uh i have the impression you know when i arrive at a certain phrase uh that that the entire novel sort of pivots on this phrase or is like a vessel or a vehicle for this for this phrase right um one of the ways you might think about that is that the phrase has has this capacity for takeoff or escape velocity where it could exist outside the novel and, and do some kind of work and i was sort of alluding to that with the way that the circulation of of something outside of of an artwork can both renders it cliche but also re can render it archetypal um and so that sense again i mean it's a little bit the, the same sense that the what happens when you start reading the novel as a as a container for that that pivotal phrase right mm -hmm. that one let's say sentence here since we're talking about prose that sentence that is, is is in some way that I think we we resist maybe as readers might be the sentence, and everything is there to make that sentence possible. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's okay. No, th those are my answers. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a lot to say about this, but yeah. just to give you two uh, concrete examples, how does that? Yeah, say? I love that. Yeah, it's, it's well, I'm just thinking, uh, I'm, I'll stop talking in a second, but like, I feel that sometimes when I get to a book and it just moves into this, and Asi and I have been talking about this, but it just moves into this place that feels so expansive and unfathomable. And yet, like, we've been <clears throat> traveling to that place all along, you know, Um so yeah, that's really great. I like the way you're thinking about this. Thank you. I have a question. Um, Alejandra, I'm curious what your experience is translating cliches and if you encounter cliches that are like universal between languages or culturally dependent and how you might translate cliches that are more like specific to a particular language if that makes sense yeah i i it's a good question um if if it's i mean it it, it depends very much on the context right and in some places you find a stock phrase in one language and you recognize that it's doing the work of a stock phrase. And so the right choice is to find a, a comparable or analogous stock phrase in the language you're translating into. Other times you have to ask yourself, is the point of this stock phrase that it's a stock phrase or is it there because of how it sounds or because of one of the words that makes it up? And so you need to, you know, for example, suppose you have a saying about a cow, and if you translate it literally, it makes no sense in English. So you go and you find another saying about a cow. Um, but that wasn't that wasn't the point, right? The point the point was that there there was something else going on. So sometimes you have to sort of break it. Um, I think that that. Uh, yeah, it's it's not <laughs> well. It's funny, right? But you can't have a stock way of translating stock phrases. You have to ask yourself sort of about about how they work, and um, what's going on in the in the you know in the original, such that this was invoked. 
The other thing, of course, is that sometimes there's stock phrases that you don't even recognize as such. Because we don't, no one has a complete, you know, catalog of these. Some of them are so common that you know them and others might be, you know, local or, or particular to some place and time. Oh, Andre, there is a question in the chat. <clears throat> oh, good. Haven't been mindful of that. Let me open that up. Let's see. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, th that was that uh, question about beauty. Um, I was, uh, I always think it's nice to end on a, a provocative note. Well, um, So, I mean, the the reason it occurred to me to invoke this is because I ended on a note of 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 questioning the pull towards novelty. In some sense, the whole talk uh, begins with a a reaction, a negative reaction to cliche in the poem I heard, and then it is trying to make more complicated the notion of of cliche. Because if we simply judge the use of cliche, say in the poem I heard that was really had a lot of them, um, and we make a sort of series of judgments saying, well, there's nothing original here. These are all cliches. On the on the one hand, yes, we're asserting our taste and probably for the better, but the the bit that I learned reading uh, McLuhan and, and Watson's book is that this the way that that <laughs> let's say the retrieval operation of the cliche right trying to trying to summon up um archetypal or important senses from the past or even from the environment um is not something we can do without and so when i started to think <laughs> right what what would be uh, instead of instead of getting fixated on originality what really would be the the criterion i thought well i mean in some sometimes the simplest answer is best i mean it still remains a question because I, this wasn't to talk about beauty so <laughs> um you will you will forgive me if i if i leave that open for now but it but it seems to me that's uh it's a simple thing to say, um, but um, I don't, I don't hear enough about beauty, and so I, I thought I would bring it up as a as a way to end on an open question, right? Uh, that if, uh, if if the other things I talked about were successfully provocative, then we could we could go in that direction. I don't feel like that was a very satisfactory answer. Maybe someone else will chime in and and push the conversation further. I have an example I want considered because you mentioned examples, and I was trying to think of some like what am I probing for with a phrase? And we've been talking a little bit in in um, yesterday's class about probing the sea for like crashed planes um, or like try, probing the forest for these crashed planes and the black boxes that are inside of them. Um, and in terms of imagining the environment and the anti-environment, I was imagining as an example, the ocean as an environment and the submarine as the anti-environment. So I was kind of wondering if that uh, example makes sense to you within within your talk and if so if the crashed plane or sunken ship at all is relating to archetype or or beauty as the as the goal of the pro mm -hmm. okay nice so yes i i like i like the the ocean as environment and the submarine as anti-environment um I mean, I don't, 
I think we should we should also have a couple of other environments and anti environments in mind, you know, but uh, uh, like for example, a uh, a hill and a, a burrow that an animal makes inside the hill, um, something like that. But um, with respect to the the probing, right? I, the way I was trying to think through it is that the the probe phrase the the language that's doing the probing work in the anti-environment has to be protected in some sense from the larger environment that's why the anti-environment is you could say secreted around it <laughs> um but in some sense what's going on in the anti-environment isn't simply that operation of, of protection or safety right it, it could be something very risky but it's right as going under water in a submarine is a risky thing um but there need there needs to be some minimum of of sort of inner coherence to the anti-environment so that this risky experiment can be pulled off and of course, I like adding the black box to it because then it's also there's a there's a recording. Right? Um, let me see how that sits with you. I'm I'm just riffing on what I heard from you. Does this resonate with with where you were going with it? Yeah, for sure. In some sense, you know the the we have to think of other examples, right? Because I do. Yeah, I mean, the the types of, of membranes or, you know, different kinds of boundaries that anti-environments have. And, you know, I'm, I'm using this language to, to be provocative, right? But every time I say anti-environment, you can just replace anything, any particular artwork or for our purposes, any piece of writing, right? Where whatever constraints allow it to exist, work to separate it from the wider ambient world of speech and in the and and the set it off right so that you know this will now this bit of language is a poem or this bit of language is a is an essay or you know and, and how, how does that distinguish and, and even right if you think about ambient uses of language like texting um there is no particular way that's set off so you could accidentally write a probe phrase in a text but it might be completely lost because nothing protects it right it would require you or somebody else to pick it out and say ah um the other day uh matt hart wrote me a a list of things we were working on and his list had went one two three four five six six seven and um and then somewhere later in the email chain he made a joke about apparently when i count i use two sixes and then i wrote him back and i said there's the first line for a poem right so somewhere in there like a thing happened Matt noticed it. And then the phrasing when he noticed it was remarkable enough that I, I picked it out, right? And so of course, oh, he did, he says he did write a poem. Um, yeah, so that that um that's a simple example, right? But it's but it's like um something becomes remarkable to him, and then his his noticing it makes me notice it. And so you have you have the beginning of right of of uh there's a, there's a little bit of takeoff or or acceleration um but notice that the initial thing the making of two sixes wasn't intentional right okay i'm gonna let me keep my eye on the chat here for a second
Yeah, um, I'm 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 reading the bit about about Black Mirror, and I've only seen a, a little bit of it, right? But you you could think about that. It, it's a premise that's common to a lot of science fiction stuff. I mean, there used to be this, you know, the, even way before this, something like Twilight Zone or, or what you will, and it, it's you could see this as based on a question right like what if such and such happened or what if the world was possible and then you 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 sort of continue to answer that question and create a, a sort of closed space more or less closed at least a defined space in which you're, you're allowed to explore it right so you get like one story in which that question is answered in the affirmative yes this is possible but of course it suggests any number of other possibilities you're just getting one story in in the world where this this possibility has been turned on so to speak jess i see a hand what's up you muted you're muted sorry yes i was so um distracted by listening to you that i forgot i had my hand up um, I was. This has been great, though, and I've been getting a lot out of your language around disguise and probe and container and, you know, setting off, um, finding language that works against like kind of the pre-existing swarm of language to set something off. And um, I guess I find myself coming back to this idea of um, making something right. And like you give kind of two, you've laid out kind of two examples where a poem might have intentionally have like this kind of tender or astral moment inside it that the poem is protecting, or it might unintentionally have it. Um, and I wonder about like the space in between that, where how do we get to that place? Like we might want to write something meaningful or something that has something that kind of works against the grain or um, speaks past itself. Um, and I'm not certain that we can always predict how to do that when we start in, or embark on a piece of writing. So I'm wondering about you and your own writing and your own reading and how you imagine like, kind of the conditions of making something that might have that encapsulated thing. Um, can you just get in the submarine to begin with or do you have to kind of find yourself in the submarine later? <laughs> yeah, maybe why I was, uh, uh, although I appreciated the example, I think it's important. You know, like I said, I wrote, I considered writing the talk with examples and then I I felt like somehow it would get too too polluted by my my own taste right and so I decided to leave it at a somewhat abstract level but then you know as much as I appreciate the summary and example I, when when you start getting examples you realize that you can close off right what what other you know sometimes this this more abstract language allows um i would go back to the sense of of probing i think that you can in some sense when i say well the phrase i used at the end um dissimulate your intentions I think I meant in 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 both in the sense of dissimulate them to others and also dissimulate them to yourself. And it seems like uh, in many many cases you you set out to write something for some out of some impulse or for some reason, um, and then it turns out that the the part that's important was not what you thought there was to say, but something else that that came out along the way, and. I, I also think this is this is one reason that practices of 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 you know everyday writing, you know where where you you don't write only when you're so to speak inspired or have strong emotions or whatever it is that that, that drives you to write, but you write as a matter of fact or as a matter of course. Um, it allows you to. Um, perform this experiment in many different moods or states of mind or intentionality. But the, I think of the pro phrase as, as a kind of instrument, right? That ought to, once you can see it doing its work, right? So one straightforward example, since I was talking about cliches is you would adopt 
one of those phrases that pops up that people start using and you would put it into the anti-environment of say a poem or an essay but you would do it in a way where the context makes it clear both that you know what you're citing and that you're misusing it or reusing it <laughs> or uh yeah doing something with it right so in that case curiously the phrase itself is not your invention it's it's more that it, it's become part of your decision to deploy it there and see what work it can do in this in this other environment so partly you're examining it and partly it's it's now able to uh break off from its kind of anonymous work right um so you know i was giving the example earlier of matt's remark about the two sixes but that's that's a joke between between friends right this isn't a phrase that has right it's it's pleasing because of its absurdity right but we could also think about doing this with with very heavy phrases with with phrases that seem very difficult to dislodge from their accepted meaning um in some way then you know when you redeploy it it seems wrong to simply say well i'm going to intentionally make it mean something else right you yeah, that could succeed i suppose you know in a, in a polemical way but it's it's a little bit like what happens if we put it in this other space and see see how how it interacts with with this new uh anti-environment how does that sound thank you yeah no that's great yeah okay um i see a, a hand from from shannon how you doing Hi Alejandro, how are you? Good, nice to nice to hear you. Yes, nice to speak with you. So um, in the last section, you mentioned context. And I am wondering in in your your you know big talk, um, when you are referencing closely reading, right? And like taking things down to the the word word level, right? And like line by line, really close reading. Um, I'm wondering at what point you kind of and you can speak entirely for yourself at what point you kind of realize like, oh, I'm going too hard at this, right? Like I have now, I've now like worked on the words to such a level that I am losing the context, right? And at the beginning, you referenced this poem that was being read that was so heavy with cliche that you couldn't really focus on the poem, right? Instead, it sort of became like you went into like teacher mode where you were just like, no, here's where like, this is a cliche, this is a cliche, this is a cliche. And it sounds like you you kind of found yourself not being able to connect with the emotions of the person that was writing this. And because of that, like, yes, they were doing it through cliche, but they were still doing it from this this place of emotion. They were trying to express themselves. And like, at what point do you have to kind of just step back and like, not not only let people feel their feelings, but also step back and and realize that like by replacing words or choosing different words, you are you are separating the context and the meaning that was meant by those cliches. And again, this can be entirely from your perspective of like when do you realize, oh, this is what I'm doing. Like I've I've now separated the the meaning that someone was trying to evoke by replacing these words. Okay, um, let's see. So first with the the example I opened with, um, the the writer I heard is an, an completely entitled to his emotions. I don't question the emotions at all. Um, I was talking about whether, and and again, I mean, I understood those emotions because I heard the poem read. Um, but I didn't, I didn't feel much of anything about the poem. I was more, I was more, you know, I wasn't, it wasn't very different experience from listening to, uh, someone simply tell a story about something difficult in, in their life in an, in an everyday way, right? Not in a way that's, that's sort of set off as a piece. So uh some of that may be a matter of taste 
but um, what strikes me is that the that type of writing seems to succeed you know in the moment because of the the sort of catharsis that it makes possible when it when it's read aloud um and again with respect to that catharsis i'm not going to question people's uh, emotional or therapeutic needs but i wondered you know sort of that's what got me going on not so much to be comfortable or satisfied with what you called the teacher mode but to try to write something that would in some sense save or defend cliche and so that was what the rest of the talk was to think about the the impulse based on strong emotion to retrieve something that allows you to say what you need to say so that's that's you know, I mean, my talk may have succeeded or failed, but if it succeeded, it was meant to be a defense in some complicated sense of cliche and the possibility of cliche rather than than a rejection of it. Um, the other bit about, you know, how close is too, is too close, I think I would just refer back to what I was talking about at the beginning of the Q&A. And I'm especially thinking of this as um, for you as as someone who I know is a, is a prose writer, and for the others who who mainly or even sometimes write prose. Um, it it certainly is true that different prose writers pay pay different levels of attention to word and phrase level matters, but it does seem to me in the same way that I said that there could be a poem hidden smaller poem hidden inside a larger poem um there can and i would even say maybe there probably should be poems hidden inside uh essays and short stories and novels in fact that might be the best way <laughs> to to hide them <laughs> um and so um it, it it seems to me then that it's less about paying this kind of micro attention to every phrase if that doesn't suit you, but rather making sure that the prose as a whole is a sufficiently nourishing or protective environment for that marvelous phrase when it when it does appear. Um, and so that's that's my answer to your your question, which I I, I took as challenging. In a in a positive way, I appreciate it. Matt, it seemed like you were starting to speak uh, or wanting to. I had I had the sense you wanted to say something. Yeah, I uh, I don't know how to use that hand raisey thing. I'm one of those uh, people that doesn't know how to use Zoom. Well, you can use the the non yeah. emoji. Um, you used a few minutes ago. You used the word um, deploy. And I, I often think about, and I, I, I guess I, I don't, I want to see if this resonates with you, but I, I often think about um, the fact that very often when we're use, using language in ordinary circumstances, like if I go to the grocery store and I have to ask someone where the peanut butter aisle is, right, or um you know using language in sort of practical ordinary ways that i am employing that language to do a certain kind of work and also trying to limit my meaning because i want to be understood in a in a very particular way i don't want to ask for the peanut butter and wind up in the automotive aisle um Whereas in creative writing, and often I, I think about this at a at a really granular level in poetry, that we are, in some sense, um, as much as we might be employing language to do a certain kind of work, we are also deploying language at the same time, and because the language comes with associations, it comes with connotation, it comes with its own etymology it comes with a whole um, history of possibilities that to a greater or lesser extent we have the ability to activate and 
you know, one of the things that a sort of uh, really cliche based writing or really or or even writing that is that's very, very focused on um, a, a very particular message. Right. It, it's limiting meaningfulness in favor of meaning. Whereas it seems like what you're talking about is trying to find ways to to deploy language so that it is working in the ways that we want, but also working out beyond us, maybe in ways even that surprise us. Um, I, I guess I'll leave it at that, but I I wonder if that resonates with you in terms yep. of what you think you've been saying here. Yeah, and um, and I guess I would just to, to to pin it back to one of the terms I introduced. What your what the deployment you're talking about is what what I think the the retrieval of the archetype is. So those recurring themes that um, uh, that have inspired people and that continue to inspire people, right? In some sense, we have we can encounter them through cliche phrases and we say let's not repeat the cliche but it's important to remember that the reason that we have the cliche is that um people keep wanting to return back to those archetypal forms over and over right and so for the for the most part um that's fine that's like a healthy functioning environment right but the the person who wants to let's say contribute something is in this peculiar place where they do want to retrieve the archetype they don't want to do it in a, a cliched way right so that's where i saw the problem you know getting too preoccupied with not doing it in a cliched way gets you stuck on novelty and gets you stuck on the 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 mission or the presence of the now which is why i among other things invoked um the sort of urgency that uh that propaganda tends to put into people's minds that there's there's something you absolutely have to do or some mission right that that that, that the writing has to accomplish and i'll connect this back to my response earlier uh to jess that you, you sort of have to disguise your intentions from yourself as well as from others to allow this this, this sort of phrase to come alive but I think that there's also, you know, I mean, this this goes a little bit also back to why I ended on the aim is beauty. Um, it seems that that there there is something of where you um, you you simply have to give up some of your own vanity to accept that you do you do want to retrieve <laughs> from that that uh, that good old archetypal stock, right? Um, uh i think precisely because a part of the conception of what it is to be an artist or a creative person now is 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 based on a recent history of making a big show of rejecting that and of saying i will i will not do that i will be completely original i will detach myself from from tradition i will be a, a parasite and a matricide and all the other sides um that doesn't you know mean that we're that, that i'm i'm sort of thinking of something that will be a, a dutiful dutiful repetition but but rather the deployment that's that's appropriate to this to this situation right and because we don't exactly know what that is i go back to this notion of the best thing we can do is sort of curate curate i made up a word curate uh, a, a some kind of of nourishing environment where the the risky operation can take place. Anyone else want to? Oh, it looks like we are. I, Jay allowed me to run over a little bit, so maybe if, if there's one more question or thought, I'd love to hear it.
All right. Oh, oh, go ahead. We have a thought. No. Okay. I, it, I don't really know. There's not really a question in here, but I was thinking a lot about, so I work in restaurants and have forever. And I was thinking a bit about like the shorthand of knowledge. Like if you've ever worked in, you know, behind you corner, I scare people in like the locker room at yoga all the time. Cause I say corner when I walk around. Um, yeah. I was just thinking about how the word choice that we use kind of either on the page or in conversation can, I don't know if it becomes cliche, but like creates community, but also kind of identifies your audience in a way. And like, there's not a question in here. This is just what's been bouncing around my brain. Um, but yeah, that that's just kind of what I've been working with and yeah. using what I'm talking about. Right. Oh, God, sorry. I'm sorry, did I cut you off or were you? Nope, not at all. <laughs> okay, it's the, the delay. Um, uh, yeah, two two thoughts. One, just a practical thing, right? Which sometimes examples help. So uh, think about that everyday use of corner, right? And now think of, think of, uh, so it's a it's a warning, right? When you're coming around a corner, yeah. yeah. And and now think about a poem that's not about restaurant work. That's about something else. Um. But that becomes a functional part of the poem, right? Mm -hmm. So once or twice or three, probably more than once, I would hope, because then I suppose in a shift, you say corner a bunch of times. So a bunch of times in the poem, there's this punctuated thing saying corner, corner. So it's a, it's, it's, a, you know, speaking to another, it's a warning. It's not, nothing catastrophic is happening, but it's more like, watch out, watch out. And so you have this device, which some might recognize and some might not, because even if I didn't know that jargon and I was looking at the poem, I'd notice, okay, well, this use of corner here isn't, I'm not simply asked to think of the corner of something, right? But it's like, you know, especially if it was followed by an exclamation point. So that would be a simple example, right, of, of, of picking up a phrase out of the environment and redeploying it inside an anti-environment where it retains some of its significance. But now we can start thinking about not just the practical thing of I got to say corner every time I do this so I don't crash into somebody, but more like what is the experience of a bunch of people working together such that with these small, you know, bursts, we kind of weave a verbal web, which is itself, you know, one element of a larger social web of like a team of people where, you know, you see what I'm going, right? And so you could, you could, you could, for example, write not about a bunch of people at work, but about a family. And even though a family doesn't necessarily have a word like corner, right, that could stand in. So that's that's one of the thoughts. And now I already forgot the second one. There was something. Oh, yeah. This is also why, again, uh, although I like the submarine, I also don't want us to only think of the submarine, right? Um, be, because because. There is, and I think I talked about this, uh, right? I, I talked at one point about the 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 separation between the environment and the anti-environment being like a fragile membrane. It doesn't necessarily have to be like a hard, you know, the metaphor doesn't have to be like hard, you know, steel that can withstand crushing things. There has to be some porosity so things can be pulled off and reused in the, in the way I just illustrated. Um and so there, you know, like I said, like the burrow is interesting because the the burrow is a hole dug into an environment, such that right there can be an anti-environment to, to 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 live in. Okay. Um we have time for one last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think okay, so last, last question. So, yes, hi. Um, I just want to piggyback off of, I, I I won't waste too much time. I know because we're out of time, but just to piggyback off of the uh, the question just now, I was wondering because as I was listening while you both were talking, I was thinking about like random phrases, 
we would say like in everyday life, like sometimes I would say something like almost like censoring in a way, like when sometimes if they say like some as an alternative to like saying the word fuck, I would sometimes say flipping burgers, like out of nowhere, almost sporadic. Mm-hmm. Would you say that kind of applies to what we just talked about when it comes to like short knowledge or like if someone say corner at a restaurant when it comes to like writing a, a poem or a, or a prose? Um, yeah, this is, this is the big question, right? But let's start by noticing that we couldn't possibly write creatively if there wasn't already that pre-existing capacity we have to replace one phrase with another and uh and have it still make sense actually have it make sense at a double level because it it both has the original sense and then it has the sense of and I'm, and I'm covering it up right um there's a, a whole just as an aside there's a whole fascinating stock um um and an earlier period of American English um when um it was uh the the sort of uh Christian um prohibition of taking the Lord's name in vain was uh was was uh more widely shared there's a whole stock of things like like darn gosh all of these all of these words that all refer refer back to words like damn or god or right um and and so we still we still inherited that whole stock and it's still used for uh soft swearing <laughs> we th- so partly it's just that that seems to be just something we do that's part of the environment doing it in a sense more actively or redeploying it um to go back to uh, matt's comment that that's sort of the beginning of the artwork or of the anti-environment right is to notice that that's happening and at some place something about it the way that's happening you know something idiosyncratic happens and and i start thinking what have i consistently sort of stuck to that right so again flipping burgers becomes a little bit like corner you you can use it in a you can employ it to not swear in front of people you don't want to swear in front of but you can redeploy it in a piece of writing to think about sort of what was that intention to both swear and not swear at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. No, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for listening and for your your uh, comments and questions. All right, y'all, we have workshop in 52 minutes.